Hello again, everybody, and welcome to this If Oxford event that's exploring and celebrating Apple Day with Ruskin College. It's a really exciting event, I think, because I think apples are such great, great fruits, but the trees are also so beautiful. Uh, so part of this event is to explore what it is that uh, makes apples and their orchards so wonderful uh, and explore some of the kind of fun stuff about apples. It's a pleasure to introduce Paul De Felice from Ruskin College. Uh, and this is the second event we've done. Uh, the first one we did was uh, exploring coffee. So these uh, events have, have got me really hungry and, <laughs> and quite excited about the food and drinks that we eat. Um, uh, so maybe Paul, if I can just welcome you uh, to the screen. <laughs> okay. Um... Yeah, it's a real pleasure to be involved in this and to work with colleagues in the IF uh, Science Festival and to make a contribution. Two things really from me, one about um, why Ruskin and another one, why apples? Um, well, Ruskin is a great college. It's a gem really in Oxford. We've been around for 120 years, for those of you who don't know us. We specialise in adult education and um, from you know 19 to 75 and beyond. Um, our average age is about 35, so we, we, uh, we pride ourselves on being inclusive and working with people to get them to where they want to be. Um, so we're a fantastic little gem of a place in, uh, in Headington. Um, in terms of the apples, this all makes perfect sense to me. Um, we have a beautiful crinkle crankle garden, which you'll see in the video in a short while. It's a unique, beautiful place of... Uh, of harmony and tranquility and work wonders during lockdown with our local community who, who spent many hours of respite there. A number of those people involved in the garden were NHS workers and may have lived in quite small accommodation. So the garden was a perfect respite for them and very kind of uh, very cathartic. Um, the apple theme fits in beautifully. Um, with, with Ruskin College, um, it illuminates apples, you know, and the celebration of Apple Day illuminates culture, science, nutrition, literature, folklore, belief, and history. And our two speakers will, will talk about that um, in, in, in great detail. In short, um, do visit Ruskin, visit us in the, the virtual world, um, visit our website. We've got a great array of community courses on offer. We've got a great array of um, daytime courses on offer, all of which are on live, on, online. Um, so do come along and join in, do contact us. And I hope you find this, uh, this video um, uh, interesting and, uh, and it, I hope it opens your eyes on what Ruskin, this perfect little gem, has to offer nestled away in Headington. So over to the video. The glorious orchards and gardens at the Rookery, now the grounds of Ruskin College Oxford, have existed for more than 400 years. There is a stunning walled garden here, dating back to 1733 with a quirky crinkle crankle wall. Crinkle crankle walls are a 17th century Dutch design, which are mainly found in Suffolk, built to protect against the climate of the Fens. So this one in Oxford is quite a rare find. Built in a zigzag design to give maximum strength for minimum groundwork, and so keeping the costs down, it has the added benefit of getting more sunshine on its angled surfaces than a straight wall would perfect for growing. The Finch family lived here for most of the 18th and 19th centuries and we know they took the cultivation of their land very seriously. According to the Oxford Journal, in 1886 the Rookery's head gardener took second prize at the Headington Winter Flower and Fruit Show for six dishes of apples distinct. We like to think he would be delighted to see how his apple trees have matured. Our ancient apple orchard is abundant with several varieties of Bramley apple trees. Orchards, especially in a city environment, are of huge ecological importance, providing tree coverage which cools the urban environment, absorbs excess rainfall and creates habitats for wildlife, thereby increasing the city's biodiversity. 
Fruit trees are particularly good habitats for wildlife because they get old relatively quickly, developing features such as hollow trunks, rot holes, dead wood and sap runs, which are irresistible to over 400 species of invertebrates that just love to live on decaying wood. Add to that the extra housing for birds, bats and fungi and we have an eco-haven worthy of an Attenborough series. If it's not the bugs that draw you to the orchard, then it must be the profusion of delicious cooking apples. Apples begin to ripen in August and September, with most Bramleys ripening in October. Once you've created every culinary treat you can think of with the freshly harvested apples, fruit pies, crumbles, smoothies, apple juice, you can store some fruit for use throughout the winter. If you have the space, apples will keep for months if stored carefully. Cider is a great way to use all the windfalls. If by any chance your cider doesn't turn out to be mellow and sweet, you can easily turn it into vinegar. Nothing is wasted with an apple harvest. We will be hosting a number of volunteer days and pruning days in the Ruskin College Gardens and Orchard. Keep your eye on the website for further details www.ruskin.ac.uk Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed that. One thing I failed to mention was obviously you can see our beautiful landscape there and our beautiful gardens and, and orchard, which are very abundant. Um, I I didn't mention we've got a new curriculum coming online in January, which is all about horticulture and green fingers and, you know, developing your skills and um, perhaps leading, leading to employment. So if you're an enthusiast of, of such, such things and you want to get involved, do again, look at our website. Um, moving on. Well, I'm very proud and happy to say that we've got two excellent um, contributors to this, to this session. Around, around the celebration of Apple, Apple Day. We've got Andrew Howard, who's um, been a lifelong enthusiast of, um, of uh, uh, fruit trees and um, leads uh, his own company called the Heritage Fruit Tree Company, based in Adderbury, North Oxfordshire. Um, spends, his, spends his time, um, an awful lot of time walking and enjoying the landscape. Is a, he bowled me over today with his enthusiasm for all things apples and um, we'll have plenty to say no doubt and we can look forward to um, a fantastic contribution from from Andrew but very welcome to you and then we have Pat, Pat Atkins um, started out as a teacher um, not so long ago I won't, I won't disclose the, the time period changed career um, and then spent three years at Pershaw College for horticulture, studying garden design and ran her own very successful business for many years in garden uh, design. For the last 10 years, Pat has been involved at uh, Mary Arden's Farm, as one of the, which is one of the five Shakespeare Trust Houses, and was a historical interpreter, uh, interpreter sorry, um, and was part of the Palmer household, um, doing all things uh, Tudor domestic. Uh, cooking, gardening, looking after the house, um, looking after pigs, no doubt, and so on, as well as, th as three orchards, heritage apples, pears, plums, and damsons. Um, an expert on uh, Tudor and Tudor life and food, apple stories, games, myths, and so on. So again, plenty, plenty to offer for our for discussion and debate to whet our our appetites. Okay. Um, so the first topic we want to discuss really is what is the, the cultural significance of Apple Day? What is it? What is the origin? You know, how does it reverberate into our, our current day, um, you know, sort of context? So over to you, Pat, if you want to lead off and then we can, we can then move through to our other topics. So uh, Pat, the stage is yours. Thank you. Oh, hello everybody. Uh, Apple Days as we know them, I think, are I think it was 1990, Andy will probably put me right on this. So they are quite modern and they are celebrating the variety of apples, fruit, the environment. But in the past, they weren't specifically to celebrate apples, they were to celebrate harvest. So round about the autumnal equinox and uh, Michaelmas Day, 
they would have a big celebration, like our harvest festivals. And they were often called Michaelmas fairs. So it was a really good time to have a party before you're getting into the depths of winter, because the next break you get is, is Christmas. Um, you've worked hard all summer. It, you are meant to have got all your harvest in by the 28th of September which is pushing it a bit for some of the apples because they won't be right. Um, but you celebrate the end of basically your hard work in the summer with one giant blowout. So you have fairs, you would have jugglers, you would have fire eaters, you'd have stalls selling all the fruit and vegetables that um, were surplus to people. It was also a hiring fair. So if you did not like the person you were working for, you could go off to the hiring fair and get yourself hired by someone else. If they didn't like you, they could say, OK, go and find someone else to work for. It was also the days when you paid your rent. So quite a mixture of things. Um, we in when I was at Mary Arden's, we used to have the Tudor Michaelmas fairs. Uh, we'd have some animals in. Um, we'd be feeding the pigs with some of the windfalls, makes the meat really, really tasty. Um, you would probably bring your geese in as well. In fact, in a lot of places they had goose fairs as well at Michaelmas, and you would um, often stick your geese in the orchard to fatten themselves up on really nice apples, so you get, get ready stuffed geese. Um, and it was a time for celebration because you hoped that you'd had a good harvest. If you hadn't, the chances are that a lot of people would starve over the winter. So it was a time when you were really thankful for good weather, good ripening weather, good growing weather. Um, in the past, people were much more in touch with the environment, with the seasons, with the hours of daylight. Um, it would be the time of year when days are starting to get shorter. Without electric lights, it can be quite miserable. Um, we tend to celebrate Halloween. Um, they didn't have Halloween, they celebrated harvest. And hopefully you would end the day with a rather nice harvest supper. So that's a bit about the background of what we now call Apple Day. I'll hand over to Andy now. It's, it's actually quite interesting, um, there, Pat, because there is actually an apple called Michaelmas Red as well, which is ready around that sort of time of year. So that tradition still keeps going through an, an actual apple exists. To, to keep I'm, I'm sure they would be eating that. <laughs> yeah, it is ready. It's already re 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 around that, that, that sort of time. But the, the key thing, like you said, about people swapping fruit and um, having things on, on, on that day is, is the knowledge, the fact that things would actually last a long time. And they actually mm. knew which varieties were available and how to store them because if otherwise they get to the hungry gap where there's no food left they haven't preserved anything and like you said they would possibly starve um uh, uh, from there but that's the key thing with, with heritage varieties and old varieties of apples apples aren't everyone assumes apples are made with green or red and you don't get much variety but there's so much different varieties around this this one here is called um howgate wonder and this has got, got a more greasy skin, a sort of waxy skin. Um, this apple actually is a small Howgate wonder, even though it's quite heavy. It's about half a pound. Um, it's got, a, you know, it's got a reasonable diameter. The largest one of these actually in existence is three, three and three quarter pounds. And it used to have the Guinness Book of Records for the biggest ever apple. You can imagine the tree which was growing that as well. It has to be a big tree and not many on it. And for at least eight years when my daughter was uh, small, she used to come down and say, Dad, it's still in the Guinness Book of Records. It's still the biggest apple. And, uh, and then unfortunately got uh, beaten by a Japanese one um, in, in, in 2010, sometime around that. But this again, it's, uh, this apple is great because it's got a thick skin. It's, it's slightly waxy. It means it can store really well. And that, you compare that with other apples like um, uh, the first sort of apples you get of the season. This is a beauty of Bath. And this is an apple, you, it's a heritage variety as well. And you're gonna be eating this in the last two weeks of July in, into August. It doesn't store at all. This one's only, we've still got this one because I've kept this in the plastic bag in the fridge uh, for, for, for almost three months. But still, 
if you put your nose to it and smell it, you can smell the summer through it because it's a thin skinned apple. It's key indication is to let out the smell to get something to come along and eat it. So um, the whole thing about actually uh, the heritage apple varieties and the history is that people knew what all these apples did. You know, they knew, knew the varieties, how long they'd store for, which ones was good. And that evolved over years and years and years uh, of actual time. Another one, which is a, a classic example as well, which people might recognize, is a more, looks more like a potato. It's sort of very yellow. It's very brown. If you could feel it, it feels a little bit like it's almost a sandpaper sort of texture. Um, I don't think I can shave with it, but it's, uh, it's quite a sort of, uh, it's, it's quite a sort of uh, rough texture. And again, russet apples generally have a thick skin uh, because they're trying to keep the apple from expiring, le le letting um, too much uh, breathing taking place. But the plus side of that means they store it re really well. And you know, it, it, Mary Arden's, one of the classic examples when I used to do Mary Arden's show with you, Pat, was I always used to bring along some leather coats, um, which again is a russet apple, which is can be traced back to Shakespeare's time. And it's mentioned in one of the actual plays, I think Falstaff talks about, bring me a plate of leather coats and it's, it's a lovely apple um tends to be with uh, i love russets but they tend to be a bit like marmite uh, lo love hate relationship don't know about what about you pat what's your preference for different types of apples i love russet apples i really do i like the yeah a lot of people don't like the texture but I, um i like a nice crisp juicy apple unfortunately because we haven't been at the farm this year i haven't been able to harvest any i my and I've got going in my garden. This one. This is false star. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Classic. It's not thing. quite ripe enough, but um, they fell off the tree the other day in the wind. <laughs> but okay. this one, it's the one I ate earlier that was ripe was bright scarlet most of the way around. This is um, still got some yellowy green on, um, but it. This is quite small. The other one was quite that I ate the other day was quite big. But that's nice and crisp and juicy. Well, um, I've, got, I've got another apple here, actually. This one's uh, is what's called a pear main shape. And this one's actually, it's called pear main shape because if you turn it upside down, it looks more like a pear than, than, than an apple. So if you ever hear an apple is called pear main, there's Adams pear main, there's Worcester pear main. They tend to be more, if you turn it upside down, they look more, more like, like a pear. Because you can divide apples into loads of different sort of categories and shapes and sizes. Um, that's, and which is quite useful when you're actually trying to do um, ID. But this one is actually came off a tree, which I was working on last week. The tree is between 80 to 100 years old. It's an amazing tree because it's um, hollow in the middle. Um, it's got a, a buttress around the bottom. It's made of bole buttress, which is like almost like it's got a big bump around the bottom, which the trees put extra calloused wood round to reinforce it. It's leaning at an, at an angle, quite a steep angle. And it's still, but it's got loads of still good growth at the, at the top. And what I was working on it, which is trying to just stabilize it, not taking much work off the tree, just the key bits, which might slightly lean it one way too far um, uh, and from it. And um, the most important thing about this old tree as well, it had some kind of noble chafer beetle in it, which is really, really rare. You only find them in trees over 80 years on. And they tend to be in trees, um, which are on their own rootstock. They've come from their own rootstock or they're a really old variety. But I haven't tried this one yet. <laughs> I've only, only picked it off. So like, this, is, this could be a unique moment to see what this variety it tastes like, because like I said, I've been saving it for a good occasion. And so I wondered if we, we, should, we should try it out and, and see yeah, what it tastes like. I think we should try it out. <laughs> yeah, it might not taste very nice at all. <laughs> you can't guarantee <laughs> that with the old, old varieties, because we might be eating this too early. This is the whole thing, but it's nice inside though. If you open it up, you can see it to the camera. It's got a nice white flesh to it, which is always a good start. It's, um, if you open the X side as well, and you put it to the camera, you can see the pips are inside there. If I take the, the actual cover over from the pips, you can see when they come out, maybe they're a sort of chocolatey brown, uh, which is like a milk chocolate brown. I don't know if you can see that against the camera. And that's a good sign. If they're white, you're not in very good. Um, you only tend to get white or white brown pips of un unripe fruit or in, in sometimes the early fruits because they don't have time to go brown. Um, normally, I like them to be a bit darker, more like a Bourneville chocolate rather than a, a milk <laughs> chocolate, but it's not always, always the case. So we'll have a look and see. Cut it open. Take out the, the, the sort of core. And then, then we're, when we take a slice. With an apple, it's always important to sort of have a good bite. and But don't initially think 
but you're going to get the flavour. Sometimes it has to sort of wait a little bit of time. It's like a good wine. Well, it's very crunchy, which is good, but also soft. And it's got a quite a sharp flavour. It's a vineyard sort of flavour. Um, a bit rem reminiscent of sort of a, a black currant or strawberry. But it's very pleasant, actually. It's not too bad. Now, you probably find that some people will like this or, or dislike it. But it's one of those ones you bite into, you definitely get a flavour sensation from it. It's definitely got underlying sweetness. So I would definitely recommend this one. And uh, yeah. And if it's stored a little bit longer, it might even mature. So that, that's what you have to find out with apples. You can get an apple. If you've got an apple in your own garden, you think it's not ready at all. If it's an old heritage variety, you might find that sometimes you've got to store it right through to January or February before it's ready. There's one called Allen's Everlasting, and you can't even eat that until March. <laughs> so, um, we used to have apples at the farm, and we'd keep them. And they, they were often quite tart to start off with. But after a few months, they were quite sweet, a bit wrinkly, but very sweet. And the flavour changed completely. That, that, that's great. As, as um, it, Paul said earlier and on the video, they've got a lot of huge, amazing Bramley trees actually at Ruskin College. And people always malign Bramley saying, oh, they're too sharp. Um, I don't have enough flavour to them. But they tend to be the ones which are picked really, really early in the season when they're green, put into storage because they store longer. But your own Bramley is like they've got it actually at Russian College. They've got an amazing amount of redness on, on them, and especially with this summer. So what you get with the red with an apple, we've got the anthocins. The anthocin is like a, a natural colour. You've got reds and you get, you get the greens. The greens basically is where the reds haven't de de developed. But when an apple's got a lot of red on, on it normally, it means it's got more sugar going to go into the actual structure of, of absorbing that. And because those Bramleys, which are you know, actually at... Um, Ruskin College, they're not that sharp at all. And if you put those into storage for a couple of couple of months, that they taste absolutely lovely. So uh, uh, Bramley people think it's a cooking apple. Yes, it is a good cooking apple, but if you store it long enough, they're, they're quite manageable to eat as well. Yeah, I think certainly in the Tudor times, they didn't have specific cooking and eating apples. They just knew that some would keep well and you could eat them. But one interesting fact I'll throw in there, that yeah. certainly in the Tudor period, Children were not allowed to eat raw fruit until they were 10 years old. Really? Oh, wow, yeah. that's amazing. <laughs> because, that's amazing. Because it's seasonal. You know, if yeah. you have a glut of some fruit and it only lasts six weeks or five weeks, you eat it all, then you get diarrhoea and stomach ache. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, of course, children's digestion is not as um, developed, so they thought it was really bad for children to eat raw fruit. They could have it cooked, but not raw. Right. Oh, okay. That delights an awful lot of small children. <laughs> so did they tend to preserve things more? The Sorry? fruit, Pat? Did they, did they tend to preserve the, uh, the apples yeah, and fruit more? Um, oh, you know, they're not more, but that's, that's what they, they did. Well, I would have thought so. To, because otherwise you'd run out of food. You know, yeah. These days we are used to having everything we want whenever we want. Whereas and, yeah. in the past you had to store it otherwise you didn't have it and strawberry yeah. season was very short you certainly didn't get strawberries at christmas <laughs> but there were lots of different ways of preserving so um, in preserving them what what sort of things did they do? is that well, an I area think the that easiest one and probably the one that everybody could afford to do even the poorest of people was drying them okay. so with yeah. apples you would peel them um not necessarily core them just take a little bit out and then you threaded them on string rather like a necklace <laughs> um, and then you'd put them in the bread oven when you'd oh, cooked okay. your bread you'd put them in there you'd leave them in overnight then you would do the same the next day until they dried or you could cut them in slices and again put them on string and you'd put them somewhere oh, wow. warm we tried it once by the fire but we had smoked apple which wasn't really very nice um, mm. That was the simplest way. Storing them, Andy said, um, we have um, apple stores. When I was little, my father used to store them in um, crates with straw and put them up right. in the loft. Oh, wow. Uh, one year at the farm, the mouse mice got in and nibbled every single apple. Yeah, <laughs> That's, yeah. bad news. So that, that was the end of bad our news, apple. Bad news, I know. <laughs> um, I'm sure everybody's heard the 
uh, saying about bad apples in the barrel. Well, you do have to inspect yeah. them all the time because if one goes bad, the chances are the rest will as well. So you have to hoik yeah. them out as soon as possible. Isn't that a nice thing to do though, Pat, isn't it? To open up the actual apple store once a week. Yeah. And actually, you know, the smell you get is just like amazing. It's just like people say, think you can't consider it a chore. You know, no. to actually open it up and smell those apples and go for your apples and check them and just like you say, get rid of the bad one. And if they're if they're stored properly, there's never a problem because if you give enough space between between each apple, it doesn't normally spread uh, to it. And the key thing I always tell people is you, when you harvest your apples is you've got to take time with them. People think apples are really hard and durable. You've got to treat them like eggs. You know, when you pick them, you have to place them gently into your basket. You don't sort of just chuck them or drop them. You won't see a commercial picker throwing them in anywhere they they, they realize they're actually damaging their goods even if they've got a hard skin but uh yeah it's a uh, it's a it's an amazing thing and like i say you've got a lovely apple store at mary yeah. Island, anyway, don't you? So, although i think if you're very wealthy in the past you would um probably store bottle or you put them in jars with uh, right. sugar syrup yeah. or even better alcohol because <laughs> you had to be wealthy to afford alcohol well sort of alcohol that will preserve your fruit and sugar um, yeah. so what we used to do we used to pickle them it's right they didn't have chutneys but uh, that's a much more modern thing but they called them pickles and you would probably pickle them inside a vinegar oh, right. um, and eat it as a sort of relish um, another thing you can do with them uh, what else did we do with them you can juice them. <laughs> and what do you make with <laughs> apple juice? <laughs> Cider. Cider. Or yeah. You can make pear juice as well, can't you? Yeah, we've got pear juice, pear juice as well. Pear um, juice, yeah. One thing to do with crab apples, not many people know that there's any use for a crab apple, but actually it makes this, which is crab apple jelly. Oh, lovely with cheese. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> um, and also we make ver juice, which has been rediscovered which originally i think it came from france and it was made with unripe grapes we make masses and masses of it with crab apples and it's the easiest thing to do you mm -hmm. just get your crab apples chop them roughly you don't wash them you don't core them you put them in a big container we have big clay pots but you put them in any cover them with water put a cloth over the top leave it for three or four days strain off the liquid and you've got ver juice and we use it it's like a weak version of apple cider or lemon juice and you use it for sauces deglazing the pans all sorts of things where you might use lemon juice or vinegar and if you leave it long enough like a year it starts to become alcoholic and it's right. very nice a sort of weak version of cider but it's very refreshing but that's so something that like, anybody can do you don't need any equipment other than a container <laughs> so that's why they might have used it medicinally as well the fact it might have an alcoholic properties because I, I know that they used it in the mid before the medieval ages didn't yeah. they bear fair juice and also um it, it, you know it's made a, a sort of comeback you know with the new cider vinegars everyone's drinking you know it's just an old traditional thing which has just been revamped to be honest with you yeah it, it's been rediscovered by chefs yeah okay who charge a fortune for a, bo a bottle of bur juice which you can actually make by just going around the countryside and getting the apples mm. Going yes. back to what you were saying um, earlier, Pat, about the baked apples, that, that tradition still sort of li lived on quite a long time, more over on the, uh, on the east coast, where you've got, the, uh, you've got the Norfolk and the Biffins, where they used to get Norfolk uh, beef, beef um, steak apples, and they used to actually put them within two wooden paddles. You get your big apple, put it into two big wooden paddles, squash it down, and then they used to stick them in the oven. And this was going right on, to, you know, into the end of the Victorian Edwardian times. Yeah. And you still go and buy one of those from from your local up from your bakery, and that would be your treat, you know, like a penny for for a biffin. Uh, All right. Was, yeah. I mean, I've got this is another way to store your fruit. This is apple butter, sometimes yeah. called apple cheese. Yeah. And you cook the apples. You chop them up. Um, you cook them. I cook them with the cores in and the seeds in because that adds flavour. 
and then you, when they're all soft and mushy, you put them through a sieve, and then it's like making jam then, you add equal quantities of pulp to sugar and you just keep cooking it until it's got very thick. And then also you can do more or less the same, spread it out in a thin layer and dry it in the oven and you've got fruit leather. Yeah, I love fruit leather. Oh. I it. And fruit leather's great for children. Oh yeah, and they love sweet. it. Um, but they, that went on for centuries of uh, making uh, fruit cheeses, quince pastes, gums and pastes. Um, the only problem was, of course, sugar was expensive. So it was yeah. often the preserve of the rich until sugar became cheap. Did they used honey for quite a while, did they, uh, Pat? They, they did. Um, honey was quite cheap until the monasteries disappeared. Ah, right. Oh, right. Because the monks because had the, the monopoly on honey. Yeah. And it was quite cheap and freely available. Once they'd gone, then a lot of the beekeepers disappeared. Uh, I mean, we've got bees at the farm. Um, but it became more of a, a luxury product. People mm. tend to think, and of course, it's very seasonal. It's very dependent on the weather. Yeah. Um, mm. if you get a bad summer, you don't get much honey. But yet they did use honey. People tend to think it's cheap, mm. but it wasn't always cheap. It's not cheap now. Uh, Excellent. Hey, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, kind of moving on a little bit. I mean. Um, Andy referred to the, the landscape at Ruskin, and it is a series of ecosystems, really. You know, there's even a, a fen at uh, a Ruskin College. It's a, an ideal environment for uh, horticulture and working with, with very close to nature. Um, but one of the things I know Andy's interested in is kind of orchard ecosystems and how that whole kind of works and how it connects with the wildlife that we have at Ruskin College. Um, you know, and I mean, if you, if you sit out long enough out the back, you can see an extraordinary array of, of creatures inhabiting our landscape. So I don't know, Andy, if you want to tell us a little bit about the uh, ecosystems. of well, well, it's, it's amazing so what you've, you've got at Ruskin College, because you've got these big old Ramleys, which are all set at sort of half standards. They're, they're big trees and the mass you get with each tree means you've got a mass of habitat for things to live in. People always think, oh, you could take a tree down and replace it with another tree and you put the same biodiversity. You can. It takes years and years and years to build back up that, that level uh, of biodiversity because you need, uh, actually, you need volume, <laughs> basically. Uh, volume for, for the actual animals to either, because most of the time they're either living in it or they're eating it, to be honest with you, or they're eating associated parts of it. So the bigger it is, the more you can do it. And small trees don't even attract birds to a certain sort of age. They've got to be a bit of the right size. And once a tree gets to a certain sort of size, any tree grows on, a, on like a curve. It, it starts off, it's growing up and up and up, and then it gets to sort of like a plateau when it keeps going along, it's very productive, producing a lot of fruit, and then it's slowly in, in decline. But the whole way through that, even when it's in the decline process, it's still providing a lot of habitat um, for everything out there. And also, when it finally actually goes down as a tree, people think that when a tree goes over and lays down, they think that's it, but it's never it. it is, uh, a lot of times, as long as that tree's still got its roots established, even if it's completely hollow, it's still got the buds still running on the outside of the trunk and it can come back and have a, what's called a phoenix rising. It will rise again and you can get another 50 years out of that tree. Meanwhile, lots going on in the inside providing habitats for noble chafer beetles other different species of beetles it's decaying but it's, it's going through what's the life stage and then into the death stage and between the death stage and life stage it's quite a long transition time but mm -hmm. both times they're actually feeding the biodiversity within the area so it's always important even when a big tree comes out and does have its innings if you can keep it on site you're actually benefiting because you need somewhere for for stag beetles um to, to live in they won't live in they need a reasonable thickness size of, of of a wood to actually have their larvae in and sometimes they have to live in there for four to five years before right. they come out and so people wonder why we've not seen many stag beetles around because we're not leaving enough dead wood um on right. on, 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 on sites uh, uh from there as well so um and it, it there's a great guy called Ted Green. He's brilliant. He, I got him. He, he, he's a member that used to run the Ancient Trees Society for him. And he said, you know, if you've got a tree which is dead, leave it standing, you know, because it's making habitat the whole time for it. Okay, it might go over again, but the longer you leave it standing, the more it's going to actually benefit things within the environment. So we've got to get into this mentality of not mm. always keeping everything nice and neat and tidy. Yeah, Wildlife yeah. doesn't benefit from tidiness. It needs 
habitat which isn't tidy. Grass lawn only gives so much habitat, to be honest with you. We've got to have a wild area. And there's, there's a movement now in Suffolk for 20% of all areas should be given over to wildlife. And that's spreading mm. now. It, that can go into your garden as well. So an apple trees benefit your garden as well. <laughs> so anything you can do to, to, to make it. But yeah, biodiversity with, with orchards, with, with apples. The, 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 I, had a, a, um, I had an email this morning from someone saying, um, uh, is it possible that uh, foxes can eat uh, my pears off my tree because they've all disappeared overnight and my neighbour's apples have gone as well and I said yeah yeah that's not a problem a fox will actually take it I've got a little black and white video from about five years ago where someone caught a fox snaffling gooseberries out of, uh, wow. out of a gooseberry bush and you can just see its head going in and picking them all out sort of thing yeah, they yeah. know and this is, goes back to the whole thing about how is an apple designed it's designed to attract things to eat it right. it's not us human beings really it's been designed for mammals and every apple has got a unique niche within nature right. that is trying to attract the right thing in. Whether it sits on a tree and then falls really quick, an early one on the ground wants to be eaten. Whether it's a late one which sits around for a long, long time because then it's trying to find another niche. Uh, uh, or, or, or the, and that's what people have to that's why we've got so many different varieties because they're all trying to do different things they're all trying to get eaten by, by things as well so it is important that uh, we keep as many trees going as much as possible yes we don't have monocrops all the time when we have more diverse mm. varieties it's fascinating that because as i if i looked out in my garden now i live in bourneville in birmingham oh, and that's like, each lovely. garden has yeah. there's loads of allotments here and each garden has a fruit tree in it and ours is a plum tree, but that's going through that transition you're talking about. So in other words, it's, it's hollowed out in certain sections and yeah. the fruit has waned, but it's still budding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's going through a long transition, isn't it? Um, it and it could revive enough, at some point. If that plum's an old enough one, you might have a noble chafer beetle in there as well, because that's one of the species they really, really like is plums. So especially because you're in Bourneville, which is sort of in the Midlands, where they you might have even have Warwickshire droopers because we still I found noble chafers in Buckinghamshire and they've been found, but I've still haven't found one in Warwickshire. So or We've other got, the farm has a Warwickshire drooper. Yeah, it's lovely with that right moment. by the um, entrance. Right. Yeah, it's beautiful that tree. They're, they're, they're lovely. That's if the wasps don't get them first. <laughs> yeah, the, the pear tree, the pear tree would have been there a hundred years. The house is like Edwardian, yeah. Oh, so okay, yeah, yeah. Hundred years. Yeah. Definitely. Yes, that's good. There's a good, there's a chance from that. And, and like all the rot, it's just all those rot holes are all great um, uh, for, 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 for habitat. So if it does go over, don't think it's the end. That's the key thing. If it does, yeah. as long as you've got the space to let it lean down, it might come back up again and you could get another 50 years out of it, possibly. Oh, wow. Or you can get some, you some probably great... remember, sorry, at the farm, we've got one or two very old ones that are actually lying on the ground. Um, and they produce lovely apples, and they're so easy to pick when they're on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that, that but, is um, amazing. amazing. That's lovely, amazing, rotten, but they're still producing apples. If if we just uh, that's that's really um, really fascinating. All that, um, Pat. If we just move on now to talk about, so I don't know if you've got any further contributions around um, apple recipes. From your from your background oh, that yeah, you could share with us and any games and so on, you know these kind of cultural things that that went on with apples, you know, which were I mean, all familiar. I, I think there are I don't know how many thousands of apple recipes. Um, as I was saying earlier, the very first written apple recipe is in 1391, and wow. it's a book called um, The Form of Curry, which was written by I think Richard II. <laughs> and it's got an apple pie recipe in there, wow. um, along with a custard tart one. So actually food doesn't change that much. Basic food carries on. The only thing that changes is spices and sweetness. But uh, this one, ha it just says take a goodly amount of apples. Doesn't say what kind or how many. Spices doesn't tell you what they are because they assumed everybody knew. And a coffin which is um, a pastry case that you don't necessarily, eat. a bit like um, hot water crust pastry. Mm -hmm. And you mix the spices and the apples, put them in the coffin and bake them in your oven. Oh, wow. But mm -hmm. no sugar. Sometimes they put 
if you were wealthy and you could afford it, you'd put figs in, dried figs to sweeten ah, it. Okay. Yeah. That'd be right. good. Um, but that's one of the earliest ones, and it's basically the same recipe that we use now. Wow. Um, mm. But there are lots of really old ones. I was just looking at one. It's called Chaucer's Baked Apples, and apparently it was the favourite of Chaucer. Yeah. Um, you just take apples, you peel them and core them, you put them in a, it says a platter, but it, I think it probably means a dish. And then you make um, a syrup with um, the galingal root, which it's a bit like a ginger, a bit like a damask rose. It's quite a hard root. You cut it up, you boil it in enough water to cover the tops of the apples. You boil it up for a while, taste it. When you think it's strong enough, you pour it over the apples, bake them, Till they're soft and then you sprinkle it says it would be um lumps of sugar you'd cut it off your sugar loaf sprinkle it over the top the apples are pink and they look as though they've got a snowy crust wow, oh, wow. I've, I've actually got a pink apple here actually if you want to see a pink this is actually a true pink apple because this is one which is which i collected the other day and it's actually it, it comes from a wild one and you've actually got this one's naturally pink inside, so I don't know if you can see, see that. Oh, that's yeah, you can see that. that as well, because this is going back to the original sort of species. Where again, the coloration is to do with the the, the uh, it's actually bleeding. The anthocyanins are bleeding through into the actual flesh. Is that like sops in wine, which is um... like sops in wine, yeah, or Pendragon, or there's another yeah. one which. Um, Man United fans might know, which is called <laughs> Red Devil. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, actually, we... if you hold that up again, yeah. You can see why when tomatoes first came, they were called yeah. love apples. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it does look like Because a... when you cut a tomato out and cut it in half, it looks like a heart. And oh, they right, didn't yeah. know what they were. In fact, lots of things were called apples. Um, I'm potatoes tried this one, yeah. are pomme de terre. They're earth apples. Um, yeah, you said that earlier, that lots of things were called apples. It's yeah, that, isn't I it? was saying earlier that... Um, Apples have a bad reputation from Eve mm. when, in fact, in the original versions of the Bible, it says it's the fruit of the tree of knowledge. It doesn't mention an apple. It's just that people decided it was an apple, but then they called yeah. lots of things apples. Um, mm. So this is good. oak it's apples on oak trees. Um, well, that's just aside from that. <laughs> right, more recipes. Um, I don't know whether anybody's ever made, it's called apple moi, and that goes back to the 13th century, which is basically stewed apples. Um, in modern day, you just mix it with cream. So it would be like um, apple fool, but they mixed it, they cooked powdered rice and cinnamon oh, wow. and almond <laughs> milk and mixed that with the apples. Uh, and then there's apple fritters, which also go back. If if you want a really nice apple fritter, you make um, tempura butter with egg whites, slice your apples, dip it in and fry them, and then sprinkle sugar on the top. Or um, they used to use ale balm, which is the yeasty stuff you get off ale, which is what we at the farm make our bread with, but you can make a really nice batter with it. Uh, so you've got a beer batter, and you dip your apples in that and then deep fry them. And they are oh. yummy. Uh, what other apples ones have I got? I'll think of another one in a minute. Do you want some nice, fun things about apples? Yeah. Myths. Yes, have. Uh, did you know that unicorns love apples? No. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> if you go... In okay. the woodlands on May Midsummer's Eve, yeah, you will find the unicorns under the apple trees. Ooh. But okay. you can only go if you oh well, if you're a woman, you have to be a virgin. <laughs> I don't know about a man. <laughs> I think you have to be a good character, and then the fairy door will open and you will see the unicorns munching wow. the apples. Oh wow, okay. And oh. then okay. I mean everybody knows about the um Wicked Queen in uh, Snow White and the Poisoned Apple. Yeah. And then you've got gold, lots of stories with golden apples in. Um, mm. Berlin was supposed to carry a branch of a golden apple tree with him as a magic wand. So that they're quite associated with magic. 
Um, and this one, this is for the, the girls. So I suppose these days I should say boys as well. You peel your apple you, on um, Michaelmas Day, you throw the peel over your left shoulder and whatever shape it makes, that is the, um, the first letter of the person you will marry, their name. Oh, wow. Mm. We do it, if we don't like it, we peel another apple and try again. <laughs> Start well, again. There's another myth, you, you get an apple, you cut it in half, you take a bite, you put it under your pillow at night and you will dream about your future husband. And you wake nice. up with a rather smelly pillow. Uh, what are the myths <laughs> have I got? Um, I like it when people do longest peel competitions as well, Pat. You know, oh when yeah, they're they, good. They have to keep going round and round and round and round. See if you can get it done in one go. And we've got this time of year when we've got um, Halloween coming up. Originally, at, certainly at harvest um, celebrations, you would have apple bopping. Yeah. We had to stop doing that because modern health and safety said it was dangerous. Uh, well, yeah, I did that when I was a kid. All you need is a big bowl with water in, float the apples in it, and you have to try and pick them up with your mouth without putting your hands anywhere and you can put your hands yeah, behind your back be on your back normally don't you yeah it's yeah. even more difficult if you hang them from string we used to hang them from limbs of the apple tree on strings yeah. of different heights and then you have to try and again eat one with your hands behind your back and it's almost impossible especially if you have big apples and small children <laughs> amazing it's fascinating um, isn't it and um, i don't know whether it certainly used to be a game we used to play when I was little, which was passing the apple from one person to another with it under your chin. All right, yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, so there were yeah, lots yeah, of yeah. apple games that yeah, were yeah. around. Yeah, like this, when it, just took it under like that. But it was this kind of, uh, it was also, um, it was interesting because in my, in my sort of, you just brought back a memory from it from my own family. My, my, my dad, and, and you know, Many many years ago, when he was a boy in the whenever the nineteen thirties, he said that was the norm at Christmas that they got fruit for Christmas. Yeah, that was that was a big deal basically. Yeah, um, uh, that was the norm. There were no poorer or wealthier than anybody else. That was just the norm. Yeah, when I was That's small, what I would have an apple and usually a tangerine and yeah. some nuts in the bottom yeah. of my stocking. Yeah, and me, yeah. it's exactly the same. Yeah. And it was always yeah. an eggman russet. It was always a russeted apple yeah. used to get because it was the right time for mm. Christmas. So I always associate russets with Christmas. And that's why I love them, possibly, because it, it's the fact, you know, we had that since we were little, you know. Yeah. Well, right. We had russet trees in the garden and we used to have sort of Christmas Eve supper. You'd have a russet apple, some cheese and some nuts. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. true. And actually, if I, mm. this would go very well with that, a little bit of um, apple butter. Fantastic. On your Christmas table, that's what mm. you should, everybody should go and make apple butter, especially if you have a glut of apples, because it keeps for a long time if you wrap it up well. Yeah, I think we, I think we're going to have to move on to the to the questions now. Oh. If that's okay, everybody. <laughs> we're too much fun. Uh, I know, we, I know, we could be here for probably for another couple of hours, couldn't we, talking it through? But uh, yeah, we we're going to move on to the questions, and Dane is going to take us through that. So we've got a couple of questions. I think the kind of cultural kind of games and activities are really, really fun uh, to think about. There are a couple of questions about the production of apples, though, the kind of basics of it. So people want to know about the cultivation. Uh, so there's one question here about the, the best growing conditions or possibly even companion plants that you might plant alongside apples to maybe ward off pests or even plants that might benefit from being associated with an apple tree or having a big apple tree nearby maybe andy this one's for you um yeah planting conditions you you, you normally just want um uh sort of good soil not bad soil apples but saying that apples can cope with more varying soils than other fruit can so if you're just going to plant an apple tree you've got more chance of going so you want three draining soil if possible um if you haven't got three draining soil there's a way you can get around it where you can make a, a mound and tump where you actually plant the tree into like a little mound uh, and then the roots spread and then it goes down in, into the soil, but generally free draining soil. Um, and you want, uh, it all depends also on the, the actual vigor of the variety you're putting into your soil as well. Because if you're putting a dwarf variety and you need better soil than something which is on a medium rootstock 
or something which is on a larger rootstock because the bigger the tree is going to be, the more it can cope with uh, you know, variation in the soil. But smaller trees don't have a, such a big root anchor, so they need a, a better soil generally uh, from that. So if you're going to plant a dwarf tree, you need to make sure it's going into better soil um, normally. Um, companion planting, there's loads of things you can plant with, with trees. Um, one of the, my favourite ones is actually uh, something called poached egg plant, which is known as Douglas limniasi, which is actually looks literally like a little poached egg. And um, I did bring a tree with me, but it's actually hidden on the back there. But there's a, there's a bit of poached, I'll just nick a bit of poached egg plant for, for a bit. To, to <laughs> This, this is what it looks like anyway, um, the, the poached egg plant. So it's got a lo lovely sort of structure to it. And then these actually grow on, uh, it's still a bit of soil and it's got, it's got it has some nice roots to it as well. And, and then they grow on and they actually produce um, a lovely white and yellow flower. And these in, 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 uh, specifically sort of will uh, encourage hoverfly larvae or lacewing um, uh, larvae along because they're attracted by the colours which means that you've got and then a, an extra beneficial. And a lot of times you'll find if you don't get any ladybirds one year, which happens with insects, because you get peaks and troughs of every insect. This year was earwigs. We were actually inundated with earwigs, which are brilliant, great aphid predator, especially woolly aphid, love them. They go from bite them all and clear them out. Um, but so uh, yeah, you can get, you, some years you won't get any ladybirds and ladybirds are the major predator, but then you get these little tiny, small sort of maggots, which are sitting on the top of your tree and underneath the leaves. Don't always assume when you see something which doesn't look nice, so it's a bad thing. A lot of the time they're actually good things. You've got to watch them study and watch them rear up and above an aphid, stick down and suck their brains out and then move on to the next one. And then you know it's a good guy, not a bad guy, to be honest with you. So uh, it's, it's, it's one of the classics. So yeah, that's a good companion plant to actually put in. So anything which you can put in which will actually attract, you know, the beneficials, the, the positive beneficial predators is it, good. Uh, what about yourself, Pat? What do you plant in your garden at all for, for benefits to benefits? Uh, well, I now have redone all my garden, so there are only native British plants in it. Right. Yeah. And at the farm, of course, we can only grow plants that were around in the 16th century, <laughs> and they're all organic. We don't use any chemicals. Um, um, I also have a dye garden there. Um, so I grow a lot of plants that the gardeners call weeds. I call and I have a, a medicine garden so I had to take those over because they will pull everything up but that encourages lots and lots of butterflies moths hoverflies all sorts of things I do love uh, a good we were trying really hard to uh, get wildflower meadows going um, are you um, believing in the powers of onions as well, any of the alliums, because alliums are great to plant around the bottom of a tree to discourage. Um... Yeah, I've got, I've, I've started certainly in the woodland, I haven't got in the orchard, um, wild garlic, because that's yeah. growing quite well. Um, and of course you can eat that as well. So what I'm trying to do is to grow things that benefit us and the environment. Um, okay, thanks very much. Uh, so just, there's another question here about sort of uh, tree management and the, someone wants to know when is the best time to prune an apple tree Ooh. and is it better to maybe prune it little and often or is it best to kind of give it a really really severe tidy up every now and again? Oh don't say the word severe tidy up because that's the problem <laughs> people fall into that bad bad practice and you don't really want to prune your apple tree hardly at all if it's already what's in, in, it's in a natural balance. If it's in a natural balance, it's got a nice shape it's producing, you don't really need to muck around with it, to be honest with you. It's only if for some reason something's happened and changed the dynamics of the tree, so it's maybe grown up really tall because it's been shaded by something else, you might have to take something out the centre. People fall into this really bad trap of thinking every winter they need to go in and hack their tree apart. And all they're doing is cutting off all the new wood from the last year, encouraging it to make new wood, which then actually shades the rest of the tree, doesn't make any fruit, and you get like a, a system where they grow up and then they spread and they grow up again. What you should be really doing if you're gonna prune a tree at all is you wanna really get into the habit of summer pruning, where you're actually pruning the tree when it's all the one year wood, which is the wood which is just grown from the spring up into the summer. You're reducing that down to, to two or three buds. All depends on the angle of the actual, the branch. The more it is on the um, horizontal, the more you want to take off. If the more it's on the vertical, you can keep on because the vertical is an ideal growing aspect. It's going out and it's getting a lot of light on it. 
And I always talk about is this is I'll call it the pruning curve. So anything between 45 and uh, uh, and, uh, and zero horizontal is good. Anything above 45 to 90 is not good. You want to reduce that down. And that's a very simple way of putting it. But if you remember that, that makes a big difference to the tree. And don't just prune a tree if it doesn't need to. It, like I said, it's got. You can always tell whether a tree needs prune. You can go and check it now, and you can have a look and see how much fruit buds are, are actually on the tree. And if, if it's got a nice amount of fruit buds, it's starting from it. You can le leave it. It's, it's only you need to only tinker with a tree a little bit to be honest. With you. Dead wood, um, possibly along those lines. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, there's a question about sort of the the pink apples that you just showed, and there was someone wants to know can you get those sorts of colored apples with an interesting so i've got you know the standard apple is the sort of white inside flesh and you know but these sort of exotic kind of colors are they possible to get hold of pat have you seen these in sort of history anywhere um, not many commercially um i mean often if people have got um if you've got friends who have got old apple trees in their garden you might get them or friends with an orchard. But I think the problem is that because these lovely apples don't all grow um, exactly the same size and shape, they've got knobbly bits in, um, they've sort of gone out of fashion. People want perfect looking apples. And they the wonky the wonky don't always taste problem. very nice. <laughs> uh, occasionally I see them um, in the odd market. If you go to a farmer's market, you might see them. I don't know. Certainly around here, I've never seen any of them in any of the large supermarkets. That, that is going to change soon, though, because there is a major commercial breeder who's now decided to bring in red apple, red fleshed apples mm. and yellow fleshed apples as well. So they're going into Europe, first of all, and we might see them back, back here because they're, they're coming to realise that these red colours, the amphicins, are actually quite beneficial. Um, they've got a lot of extra vit vitamins in there because this here is actually what's called a wild malus severzi. This has come from a, like a wild tree and it's actually gone back to a type where a lot of the apples ended have the colour in them. So all they've done is gone back to the original varieties, crossbred them and actually brought something out with a bit of colour. So whether they will appeal to people, we'll have to wait and see because um, every, everyone's always trying this different stuff out. But we don't know if people, this one tastes really good. It's got like, and this is a wild one. I just found this just outside Aino. So there's anyone listening from Aino. There's a lovely tree just on the edge of, as you go into Aino, big tree. Uh, and I also had a, a big sort of brownie almost fall on my head when I was finding this one, but uh, these were free. <laughs> they were just I on the ground. If you go foraging in hedgerow, hedgerow especially very old hedgerows, you yeah, sometimes yeah. find some quite interesting apples growing there. Um, so people should go out foraging more. There's so much Definitely. food out there. But just avoid anything next to a very busy road. That's all I'd say to people. <laughs> That's a good warning. Or, or at dog level as well. Or at That's dog level, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Never eat the yellow snow, isn't it? That sort yeah. of. Um, so this, so this, oh, a red apple that you've just shown us, um, Andy. You said that that's a bit more nutritious, maybe it's got more anthracins, did you say? It's... Yeah, that's what the argument is, is why they're bringing them in. But they've actually, I had one guy contact me ages ago and he wanted to know every single red apple I knew about because he was interested in breeding them. So I don't know if he was related to this guy because it's going back four or five years. Um, but like I said, there is a history in, within heritage varieties. There is the Sops in Wine, which makes a nice sort of red apple. Um, there is there's one which was called All Grove Red, which made a red apple. There is the Pendragon. They, they, you know, they, 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 everyone thinks there's a new thing, but it's not. It's been around. Things get reinvented. There's a, there's a classic um, pair called uh, Humbug, which is like yellow and red striped. And someone's copyrighted it as a new variety but i've got a book down here which actually shows it existing in 1812 and it's known as it's known as a uh, longer vers it's named after the um or swiss longer ver. it's named after the trousers of the swiss guard in the vatican <laughs> so you know that is something I mean, you can't you know everyone thinks they've got something new it's not nature's already probably developed it if there's a reason before it in the first place so uh, um yeah and then sort of so there's another question here about sort of the nutritional level so obviously some not all apples have the same amount of nutrition and sort of um, health benefits some people are asking about it does cooking change any of these kind of nutritional levels or the health benefits that people might get from an apple or is it best to eat raw heritage ones generally and i'll, and I'll go for the pat in a minute but heritage ones it was proven two years ago some scientists actually at buckingham university did the research and i had a boom then because it, they found that heritage varieties have more vitamins and more paraphenols the, the key elements you need 
to actually keep you healthy than more modern ones. And the, it's the rationale for that is these are back to geno, they're back to the original sort of genotype, the original variety, close and related. We've bred all that out of them. The goodness has been bred, bred out. So they are breeding back. But Pat, I don't know about, about cooking. Do you think it, it benefits to, to cook? I don't know. It will kill off some of the vitamins. Depends how you're cooking them, really. Um, I think if you cook them slowly or dry, I suppose the best way to, is to have the dried apples because that's going to concentrate um, the vitamins and the taste. I mean, I love dried apples and they just reconstitute them with a bit of water. Um, I don't really know because in the past they didn't know about vitamins. <laughs> <laughs> so other than the you know the saying about an apple a day keeps the doctor away so sometime in the past someone must have decided that apples did something um i don't find many old herbal recipes for apples other than say apple vinegar okay um and then there's a final question uh, just before we kind of finish off is that what is the best way to store apples? Sometimes we put fruit in the fridge, sometimes we just have it out on the on the kitchen top. What would you say is the best way to store things long term and also short term? Just to give um, people some advice. Well, I could both but maybe give some advice on this. The key thing I would say before, as I said, you've got to actually treat them as eggs. That's the most important thing. You don't bruise them. And then you, when you're picking them, you have to grade them as well. So you have to grade A, B, C, and D. The C's and D's you're going to use up. That's where you, you pack the ones where it's going to be cooked and like processed, etc. But the ones with a good, good quality, with hardly any blemishes, maybe got their stalk on. They're your A's and the B's, and that's the ones you want to put into storage. You don't want to put anything bad into storage um, from, from, from day one. The other thing is, if, if you know, I can show you what I use. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a more modern version, but um, I don't know if you can see that. I use actually plastic mushroom trays. Which, which are quite good because you can stack those easily. Good ventilation between between them. You can keep the spaces between. That's one thing I use. I also use. Um, um, I, I will actually hang them up in plastic bags as well in the garage, where so they're actually sitting in their own um, ether, ether when it comes out, so it's stored if I'm got enough space. The key thing is to make sure that they're, they're good before they go in. And then, and also you've got to know what you're storing. Because <laughs> if you don't know what you're storing, there's no point putting Beauty of Baths into store. And then, um, and then they're, they're, they're gone off within two weeks. You've got to, but look at the thickness of the skin, okay? Is it a thick or a thin skin? Is it a greasy skin? Or is it, is, is it a, a non-greasy? Because if it's greasy skin, it's, gonna, it's, like, it's like pumpkins. When you have a, a greasy, waxy pumpkin skin, it's going to store longer. Nature's trying to tell you what to do with it uh, uh, from it, compared to a thin skin where you can smell. If you can smell it normally, it's not going to store very long. Okay, so if you can't smell it, it's going to, if you smell it, it's the, the way, that's the way it means. And if you've got an apple tree in it, experiment, you know, put it into storage, see what happens, see when it's ready to come off the tree, see when the pips go brown, etc. Try to get to know your apple tree and then you'll know how to store it, how long it will. And you can get apples if it's a good cold winter, they can store right through um, to May. You know, there's apples, it's called two year old apples because it goes from one year to the next year. But Pat, what, what do you think about um, storage? Well, I, if, if, I mean, I don't have enough apple trees at the moment, but when I was younger, we had a lot and we would store them in on sort of um, trays with gaps in, uh, wrapped in store or occasionally in newspaper, but that didn't always work, but just on a little bed of straw so they didn't get damaged. I know in the 16th century, they would sometimes make um, willow, little willow um, pallets with, so they okay. had air gaps in and yeah, you yeah. Could put the apples on that. Got it. So, so not so not the fridge, but plenty of air to circulate them in a coolish place in the kitchen yeah, somewhere, maybe. Cook. And and no no mice. No mice. That's a good. Can always a good tip. Is, always a good tip. Anyway, I think it's time. I think it's time to sort of pass on to Paul for a, a, a couple of. I mean, I've got loads more to talk about. We've all got loads more questions to ask. But how about Paul? What have we learned about apples, and how can we learn more? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I'd like to thank our panellists and everybody involved in this. I've, I think it's been a, a great survey um, covering most things from games through to like 
how how we deal. I mean, I, I've certainly learned something about my plum tree. Um, that's that's great. That's answered a lot of questions for me. So thanks for that, Andy, and thanks, Pat. I think going forward for us, watch our our, um, our website for further activities around the orchard and around the garden because we're really keen on uh, on engaging people in, into our landscape. So stay in contact with us. We have got this. We are developing a curriculum around sustainability and the environment, um, but very immediately, we have got a course starting in January all around horticulture. So do come and join us. Uh, come and visit the campus. Come to one of our virtual open days. We'll talk to you some more about what we can do um, because we really want to make you know our, our campus open to all and um, make it into a learning environment. Um, so I thoroughly enjoyed this evening. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to our colleagues at, uh, at IF and our two panellists. Fantastic. Excellent. Yeah, Thank really you. Really lovely. Thank you for the opportunity. And I've been to the orchard and I've been to the garden. And it's lovely. There's no, you can just get in, you can have a look around. It's just, oh, it's just a lovely place, isn't it? Very content. Um, I'm definitely going to have to come and visit you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll, bring but, some, uh, I'll bring you some pies. <laughs> you're always welcome. <laughs> And the college is beautiful as well. The inside of the college is amazing. If I was back, if I wanted to study, I'd love to come and study there because the environment's really, really nice. It's got, really you can look through the old build, you can look down from one of the lectures over the actual wall garden. You've got this amazing view of the wall garden. And then also you're looking at some of the old buildings for the other side and you can look for miles down there. And it's just, you've got these amazing, not just fruit trees, you've got these amazing huge trees, which is, everyone's beautiful. You know, it's just like, it's like a haven. You're so lucky to work there, Paul, to be honest with you. It's, you know. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a privilege. I always say to people that we're blessed, yeah? Not everyone believes me, um, but it's true. We are blessed. It's a beautiful campus, beautiful classrooms, plenty of resource, plenty of space. Uh, so do come and join us if, you, if you're interested. Well, if and when and do we come and visit us, Pat and, and Andy. At the farm, you'll have to come and visit us. <laughs> yeah, we'll do. I'll, I'll take you up on that. So watch this space. There's more for us to talk on, on this. This but is an mean, ongoing project. But meanwhile, everybody, enjoy the colour of the leaves turning, enjoy the apples to celebrate the rest of Apple Day. Uh, and the festival's on for more than a week uh, to go. Uh, and so please come back. But tonight was really good fun. So thank you, Paul. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Pat. Really informative. <laughs> Lovely questions from people. Uh, do give us your thoughts on the feedback form once it comes through. And we'll hopefully see you at more festival events. Good night, everybody. Good night.